Um, good afternoon. Welcome to the first of our two-part webinar series providing an overview of insurance and insolvency in construction projects. We start today with the basics of insurance for construction projects. Uh, insurance cover is an important aspect of every construction project, but insurance policies are complex and insurance companies can often be reluctant to pay out if policies are not followed correctly. It's therefore necessary to understand the various features of construction insurance. Our next webinar in this two-part series will be on a related topic, which is insolvency in construction projects. Now, both of the webinars from this series are recorded and are available on our Vimeo site if you'd like to listen again or share with your colleagues. So just before we begin the main uh, webinar um, topic, to minimize background noise, and you've all been placed on mute, if you would like to ask questions, please do so using the webinar chat function, and time permitting, we will answer those at the end. So I am Ian Drummond, a partner in the Projects and Infrastructure Disputes team in Shepherd and Wedderburn, and I specialize in construction and engineering dispute resolution, and I'm based in Edinburgh. I'm joined by Kate Gillies, an associate in my team. Our team regularly advises on construction contract issues and disputes across a range of projects and clients and throughout the whole life of contracts. We therefore have a lot of experience in advising in circumstances involving insurance claims or insolvency, and this experience forms the basis of our strategic advice and what we will share with you today. So I will now hand over to Kate, who will take us through the agenda for this webinar. Thanks, Ian. So first of all, we'll touch briefly upon some of the key terms and principles of insurance, and that will be relevant to the later parts of this webinar. Next, we'll address some of the different types of insurance that are relevant in the construction industry. Thirdly, we'll consider some, uh, several of the most common standard form contracts and what the default insurance provisions are in each. And finally, we'll discuss two recent cases, including the Glendo Hydroelectric Scheme case um, and what they mean for the construction industry from an insurance perspective. So moving on to the key terms and principles. Some of the key insurance terms and principles will no doubt be familiar to some of you, so we'll only spend a couple of minutes running through these. Firstly, insurance is a type of contract. It's commonly referred to as a policy entered into to guard against the loss or liability in specified circumstances. The parties to the contract are known as the insured or the policyholder and the insurer or underwriter. In exchange for the payment of premiums, by the insured to the insurer, the insurer agrees to compensate the insured if the insured suffers loss or liability arising from an insured risk. This is a crucial component of insurance contracts. For example, if your house is flooded, it's not enough just to say, well, I have house insurance. You must make sure that flooding is an insured risk under your house insurance policy. If not, the insurer will have no liability to compensate for the losses suffered. Most insurance contracts will have what's called an excess or deductible, the effect of both being to make the insured bear a proportion of the loss itself. So for example, if there's a £1,000 excess or deductible, then on a £10,000 claim, the insured will only recover £9,000, having to fund the extra £1,000 themselves. Most insurance policies also have a policy limit or limits, being the maximum sum of money which the insured can recover. Often there will be an individual limit, which is the amount of money the insurer, insured rather, can recover in respect of any single claim, and also an aggregate limit, being the maximum sum of money which can be recovered in total in any given year. While all policies of insurance are aimed at compensating for losses arising from insured risks, there are various different forms of uh, insurance policies, and in the context of construction insurance, the main forms uh, that are required on projects are, firstly, insurance of the project works, secondly, third-party liability insurance, and thirdly, professional indemnity insurance. There may be other insurances in place for the benefit of individual parties, but that may not be a specific project requirement. For example, Many contractors will carry contractors' all risk insurance, which ensures the contractor against a package of known and specified risks. 
or certain projects may require construction all risks insurance, which may bundle together insurance of the works, third party liability and professional indemnity insurance. The function and purpose of insurance of the works is to protect against damage to the works under construction. Works insurance is therefore typically for the benefit of contractors, protecting them against extra expenditure in carrying out repairs or replacements necessitated by damage to the works due to insured risks. The main insured risks under such policies will tend to be fire, earthquake, floods, storms, vandalism and theft. In other words, things which would damage project works and delay a project, but which are not in the control of the contractor. Works insurance does not typically cover damage to existing buildings or structures on site. So, if, for example, there is a construction project which is building an extension to a pre-existing building, and a flood causes damage to both the partially built extension and the pre-existing building, a works insurance policy would compensate for repairing the extension but not repairing the existing building. Damage to the rest of the building, the rest of the existing building, would need to be guarded against by a separate policy, typically a standard home or buildings insurance policy. Normally, Works insurance takes the form of a joint insurance policy taken out in the names of both the contractor and employer. And generally, a payment to one co-insured will not entitle the insurer to subrogate against another co-insured. And this means that if damage occurs which is the responsibility of one co-insured, the insurer is not entitled to sue that party for the damage because the policy was for the benefit of that party too. Issues relating to subrogation will be the focus of our case studies uh, later on in this webinar. Now, third party liability insurance. This is the second main type of insurance relevant to construction projects. And this form of insurance aims to guard against liability for property damage or personal injury caused to third parties. So such insurance would be relevant where, for instance, materials fell from the construction site and injured a passerby, or where a fire broke out and spread to an adjoining property. Insurance of this kind is fre frequently known as public liability insurance, as it aims to protect against liability to the public, in other words, third parties. It is also worth noting that a third party liability is often combined with employer's liability insurance. Employer's liability insurance is taken out by employers to guard against risks to their employees rather than risks to the public, as in third party liability insurance. And now, employer's liability insurance is not specific to construction projects, but it's compulsory in the UK for all employers to have an employer's liability insurance policy in place. That type of insurance is of significance in the construction industry given the inherent risks involved in building works and is often therefore combined with third party liability insurance. Finally, um, professional indemnity insurance. Um, this is often known as PI or PII and this is designed to protect architects or engineers or other um, professionals against claims brought by their clients in contract as well as claims brought by clients or third parties in respect of any negligence committed in the course of the design, supervision or administration of the building work. The principal objective of PII is to protect against any negligence in the performance of that professional work. Although mainly focused on protecting architects and designers and other professionals, Contractors may take out PII in circumstances where they have adopted a design responsibility. It's an, it's an important point to note, however, that PII will only cover failures in design that are the result of professional negligence or the equivalent contractual standard. 
A designer will be measured to that end against the ordinarily competent professional at the, t the time the design or other professional service is undertaken. And only if they fall below this standard will PII cover step in and compensate for the losses. This can be problematic, for example, if a design, for example, is produced to the state of the art at the time, i.e. to industry standard design guidance, but subsequently new information or guidance moves the state of the art forward, perhaps by altering the standard guidance or exposing errors in the pre-existing guidance. Now, in such a case, the designer would likely not have been negligent having, for example, designed to the state of the art at the time, as an ordinary competent professional would have done, and PI cover would not therefore apply in that event. Thanks, Ian. Um, we'll move on now to look at how the standard form contracts approach construction ins insurance, considering what insurance is required and who is responsible for arranging the necessary insurance. We'll look firstly at JCT and SBCC contracts, and then NEC3 and NEC4 contracts. So the JCT and SBCC standard form contract insurance provisions are identical in both. So whether the project is being undertaken in England under, under JCT or in Scotland under SBCC, the insurance provisions are the same. We'll look at one of the most popular forms, the Design and Build Contract of 2016. The first general point to note is that the insurance provisions of JCT are very detailed and prescriptive. The contract makes detailed provision for, firstly, insurance against personal injury and property damage, secondly, insurance of the works and existing structures, and thirdly, the professional indemnity insurance that Ian was just discussing. So, Clause 6.4 requires the contractor to maintain insurance to protect against liability for personal injury and death or damage to property, excluding damage to existing structures, the works or site materials as a result of the works. This is the equivalent to the third party or public liability insurance we mentioned earlier. For insurance of the works and existing structures, Clause 6.7 and Schedule Part 3 provide for three different insurance options, which a client will have to select which one is best applicable to the project. Options A and B are for new builds, while option C is for works involving existing structures. In summary, the requirements of these three options are as follows. Under option A, the contractor is required to take out and maintain joint names, all risks insurance of the works. Under option B, the employer is required to take out and maintain joint names, all risks for the insurance of the work. And under option C, the employer is required to take out and maintain joint names specified perils insurance in respect of the existing structures and their contents, and also all risks insurance of the works. It's worth noting that the 2016 edition is now more flexible as to who provides what aspects of the cover required under option C. This is because it can be difficult for an employer to take out such insurance if, for example, they are only the tenant of the building or the owner of a domestic property. The all risks insurance is insurance which provides cover against any physical loss or damage to work executed and site materials, so it's effectively insurance of the works during the project. However, despite the name, such insurance rarely covers all risks. For example, the JCT and SBCC contract excludes wear and tear for property defects and acts of terrorism. Under clause 6.15, this obliges the contractor to take out professional indemnity insurance with limits not less than those stated in the contract particulars and to maintain such insurance until the expiry of the period stated in the contract particulars from the date of practical completion of the works. Turning now to the NEC standard form construction contract, as most of you will be aware, NEC 4 has recently been published, so we will focus on the NEC 4 engineering and construction contract, although we will highlight the key changes from NEC 3 uh, regarding insurance provisions. Before we look at the provisions and changes, one important point to note is that the level of detail in the NEC contracts is much more limited than in JCT or SBCC. The relevant section on insurance under NEC 3 was known as risks and insurance. But in NEC 4, 
this section is renamed liabilities and insurance. Um, and we understand that's because risks was thought to be the source of some confusion. NEC 4 Clause 83.1 specifically requires the employer to obtain the insurance policies set out in the contract data. Previously, this was not stated explicitly, but was implied through NEC 3 Clause 84.1. NEC 4 Clause 83.2 requires the contractor to take out the insurance stated in the insurance table in the joint names of the parties until the defect certificate is issued or termination. Now, as you can see on the slide, and this insurance table covers insurance of the works as well as third party public liability insurance. And if you look at the slide, you'll find uh, the insurance table from NEC4 uh, reproduced. And you'll see that it um, has two columns. The first column, which sets out the elements that cover is to apply against uh, and which is to be insured. And the second um, column specifies the amount of cover that's to be provided. So that is the insurance that's to be taken out by the contractor under NEC 4 Clause 83.2. Now, there are a number of other subtle changes between NEC 3 and 4 insurance provisions. NEC 4 Clause 84.2, for example, provides for a waiver of subrogation rights in relation to all insured parties, rather than against only the former directors and other employees of every insured, as was the case in the earlier versions of the contract. This is quite an important change. As we've already discussed, waivers of subrogation prevents insurers from taking action to recover sums from any co-insured who are allegedly to blame. The effect of clauses of this kind was the subject of disagreement in the NEC 2 forerunner to this clause, and this was dealt with in the recent Glen Doe case, which we will discuss shortly. One clause which hasn't survived the change from NEC 3 to 4 is Clause 85.4. This clause provided that any sums which have not been recovered by an insurer are borne by the parties in accordance with the agreed allocation of risks. Now, if parties are using NEC 4 and wish to include such a clause, it will therefore be necessary to reintroduce this provision by amendment. Finally, Clause 85.1 of NEC 4 provides that if the contractor does not demonstrate to the employer that it has obtained insurance, by providing the required insurance certificates, the employer is entitled to take out insurance itself and to recoup the cost from the contractor. Moving on now to the case study section of the webinar, there have been several high profile cases in recent years in which the insurance provision of construction contracts have been placed under the spotlight. One well known recent Scottish case is SSE Generation Limited against Hockey Solutions which is commonly referred to as the Glendo case, since it involved the collapse of a tunnel at a hydroelectric plant at Glendo in the north of Scotland. The Glendo case centred around the collapse of a tunnel designed and built by the defenders, German construction company Hochtief Solutions, for the pursuers, who are a subsidiary of the Scottish energy company SSE PLC. This is one of two tunnels that were to form part of a hydroelectric plant at Glendo in the Scottish Highlands, and the cost of repairs came to over £130 million. The party's contract was based on the NEC 2 standard form contract, which dates back to November 1995. Now, Clause 83.1 of that contract provided that each party indemnifies the other against claims, proceedings, compensation and costs due to an event which is at his risk. Clause 84 required the contractor to take out an insurance policy in joint names to provide cover for contractors' risk events. This provision also stipulated the insurance policy should include a waiver by the insurers of their subrogation rights against directors and other employees of the insured. Waivers of subrogation prevent the insurers from pursuing certain parties, so in this case the waiver only applied to the directors and other employees of the insured. Now, SSE argued that the collapse of the tunnel was a contractor's risk event 
and accordingly they raised an action against Hogteeth for over £130 million, the vast majority of which related to the cost of remedial works. In response, Hogteeth contended that the joint names insurance policy, which Hogteeth were obliged to take out, had the effect of preventing either party from bringing proceedings against the other in respect of loss covered by the all risks policy. SSE should, therefore, have been barred from raising the action against them. So the question being asked in this case was essentially whether the co insureds were entitled to sue one another, as Clause 82.1 says they can, or whether this was prohibited by implication arising from the insurance requirements of Clause 84. The judge at first instance in the court session held that the provision for joint names insurance did not displace the party's liability to one another under Clause 82.1. In other words, the fact that Clause 84 of the contract required the parties to take out a joint names insurance policy did not prevent the parties from suing one another. If this were not the case, the judge considered that Clause 83.1 would be redundant. Moreover, the judge considered it significant that there was no waiver of subrogation rights in respect of the parties themselves, only against the directors and employees of the insured. So this conclusion that was found to be surprising to some, as it had long been thought that where parties have taken out a joint names insurance policy, that they are barred from suing one another in relation to an insured loss. After the Glendale case was decided at first instance, but before it was appealed to the inner house of the court of session in Scotland, the UK Supreme Court gave judgment in an English insurance case which addressed this very issue. The case was about a shipping contract involving a boat called the Ocean Victory. In the Ocean Victory case, the Supreme Court held that there is normally an implied term that co-insureds cannot claim against each other in respect of an insured loss, and there were some suggestions that it would be inconceivable and absurd for this not to be the case. So after the Ocean Victory case was decided, the Glen Doe case um, was appealed to the Scottish Appeal Court, the inner house of the Court of Session. That appeal was heard by three judges who each gave separate opinions. The judges accepted in principle that the Supreme Court decision in the Ocean Victory, although not strictly binding, should be followed in Scotland. However, the judges disagreed as to whether, on the facts of the Glendale case, a term was to be implied into the party's contract, which would prevent them from suing one another for insured risks. Lord Glennie, with whom Lord Mingus agreed, took the view that such a term was to be implied into the party's contract, he was not convinced that the implication of a term preventing the parties from suing one another in relation to insured risks conflicted with Clause 83.1. That was the clause which obliged the parties to indemnify one another for the risks they were liable for. And he held there was no conflict there because the, the clause, the provision at Clause 83.1 was wider than the scope of the insurance clause. So this meant the parties would still be able to sue one another for non-insured risks, even if they could not sue in respect of insured risks. Furthermore, Lord Glenny took the view that whether or not there is a waiver of subrogation rights is actually irrelevant to whether the parties can sue one another. The Lord President, however, took the opposite view. He accepted that there is a presumption that there is an implied term in a contract preventing litigation between parties where there is joint insurance, but he noted that in the present case this presumption was rebutted because he stated that there was certainly no necessity to imply such a term for the purposes of business efficacy, that being the legal test for the implication of a term into a contract. Now, although the decision did not necessarily turn on this point, given that there was a difference of opinion in the inner house on this and many other points, combined with the very high value of the claim, it's highly likely that this case will be appealed to the Supreme Court. So this is therefore a case to look out for, as it will have significant implications for the construction industry as to the relationship between contractual provisions apportioning responsibility 
and joint insurance provisions. Thanks very much, Ian. Uh, we've now come to the end of this webinar. We hope it's been useful and interesting. Um, we do still have a few minutes left just now, so if you'd like to, haven't, if, sorry, if you haven't already done so, if you'd like to type any questions into the text box, and just see, we've got a couple of questions here. I'll just give Ian a moment to digest that. While you're doing that, I'll take the opportunity to remind you that this is the first webinar in a two-part series. So our next webinar will be on a related topic, insolvency in construction projects, and that is on the 12th of June 2018. We can hope you can join us for that webinar too. Uh, both of the webinars in this series will be recorded and they'll be available on our Vimeo site. So if you'd like to listen again or share with colleagues, please do so. We'll be sharing details of the next webinar and how to listen again to all who signed up to this webinar after we've finished today. Um, okay, one, one question that we've got, which I think can be taken quite short, is um, why in the Glen Doe case the parties were, or one party was suing the other, uh, and, and whether or not a claim had been made under an insurance policy. Um, and uh, I think the answer to that is that it's not, there's not much information about that um, in the case report, um, but there is a reference to there being an arbitration um, as between the claiming party and the insurer. So clearly an insurance claim must have been made but was contested. So that must be why uh, a litigation was then launched against uh, a co -insured, the, the co-insured and to recover loss um, separately. Now, we also have um, quite a detailed um, question from, from somebody in relation to the SBCC Minor Works contract. I think that would probably take a little while for us to answer, so rather than detaining everyone, um, what we propose to do is we'll have a look at that and we'll come back to uh, the person who answered, uh, asked that question, because I think the, the answer will probably not be short. Um, so we will do that, and um, otherwise I think that um, comes to the, the end of our webinar. So um, thanks very much for joining us. We, we appreciate you doing so. And as Kate said, um, we hope you'll be able to join us on the, in, for the second webinar in this series on the 12th of June, which will deal with insolvency. Thanks very much. Thank you.